Hour Hit Parade, starring Frank Sinatra. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And now, smile a while with Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. Manhattan Merry-Go-Round that brings you the bright side of life, that whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town, to hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing them yourself. This is the golden age of radio. I'm Dick Bertell, and tonight we'll take you on another audio excursion back to radio's formative years. You'll hear the programs that made the era golden, and meet people who made those broadcasts a reality. The Golden Age of Radio is brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889, and by WTIC. You'll meet announcer Tony Marvin after these words from the Burrett. When looking for that new car, here's a suggestion. Go to Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. No, the Big B does not sell new or used cars, but it does help people to buy them. Chances are that you didn't know that Burrett Mutual Savings Bank will make you a car loan at low, low rates. Before buying that new car, call any of our five convenient offices for information. But wait, that's not all. You will need another car when this one wears out. And the Big B has a plan for that too. When you finish your new car loan, keep on making the payments into a Burrett Mutual Savings account where you will earn big, big dividends with no effort at all. Rates range from 5 to 6%, depending on the plan you choose. But whatever the plan, the next car you buy will be paid for by your Burrett Mutual Passbook. So don't wait. Drop in at any office of the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank for your new car loan or to make that monthly payment on your old car loan. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. New Britain... West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury. Member FDIC. And now your host, Dick Bertell. Good evening. And with me once again is the man with some 2,500 hours of old-time radio memories on tape, Ed Corcoran. Dick, we have a man tonight who's going to upstage both of us with his voice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody in the world like him. Uh, I refer, of course, to the great Tony Marvin. That's right. Tony, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. <laughs> You know, we're going to be able to cover ground tonight that we have never been able to cover before because you are the first announcer that we've had on the show. We've had actors on the program, we've had producers, directors, sound effects people, but you're the first announcer. Well, I'm honored. Believe me, Dick. Ed, I'm uh, overcome, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you can pull yourself together to do the show. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the best I possibly can. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. most people don't realize what it was like for a person to be on staff at one of the networks in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. And that's the area that I want to explore with you tonight. But we really have to go back to uh, 1937 and WNYC for your radio debut, don't we? That's correct. That's correct, Dick. Uh, I was a, oh, an aspiring actor, you know, and... Uh, just came in off the road. We had died on the road with a, <laughs> uh, a national company of Having Wonderful Time, which was a great play. I was uh, very much intrigued by the new radio station, WNYC, that uh, had been refurbished and remanned, uh, and uh, they did a magnificent job at the top of the municipal building down there. And I was on my way to a, uh, an audition up at NBC for some dramatic role. I had a book of plays with me, and uh, but I did have about two hours to kill, so I thought I'd just dash over to WNYC, see what the new studios were like. And I was met at the reception desk by a little white-haired old lady, and I asked her if I could see the studio manager, and she said, uh, well, he's very busy giving auditions. And I said, oh, I said, I wanted to have a tour through the studios. And she said, well, uh, you'll have to take an audition. I said, I don't have to take an audition. I just want to come up here and look at the studio. <laughs> Well, we argued back and forth, and finally I said, all right, give me that piece of paper, and I filled it out, and I went in, and there, behind the glass, you know, a couple of chaps, and I turned to him, I said, are you the studio manager? And he said, yes. I said, fine. I said, I did want to come in to see what the studios were like, and thank you very much. I've seen this one out. I'd go see another one. He said, well, aren't you going to audition? I said, no. 
He said, what, you're here for an audition? I said, no, I'm not. I came in to see the studio. You know? <laughs> Beautiful. So he finally insisted that I do so. I said, look, I said, I happen to be a singer. I'm an actor. I'm on my way up to NBC. And uh, I really don't have much time. He said, well, won't you do something for us? I said, all right, I will. And I flipped open the book and uh, plays. And I think it was something from the valiant taste of death but once, you know. And I read it. And he said, wait a minute. Don't. <laughs> Call someone else. And You're uh, our man. <laughs> He said, how would you like to join our uh, dramatic group here at WNYC? I said, uh, well, I might, you know, learn something about this crazy business. He said, fine. I said, how much money do you uh, pay? He said, nothing. <laughs> I said, goodbye. <laughs> you know. But uh, I finally said, all right, I'll go along. And, of course, that led to my being appointed as a member of the staff at uh, WNYC by Mayor LaGuardia, who had heard me portray the part of a priest in one of the plays we did, and he was very much impressed by the depth of my voice, I guess. And he got me on the phone and told me that he'd like to have me on the staff and he would appoint me. Because that was a civil service job. That's in those right, days. that's right. And, uh, the station is owned by owned the city. By, that's right. And that started my real uh, career in radio and later on television and radio both. We were talking uh, earlier about the World's Fair and, and you played a prominent role in covering the 1939-1940 World's Fair. Well, it was the 39, actually, Dick. Uh, I had uh, covered the building of the fair as a special event feature for WNYC. I had then been moved up to director of news and spe well, special features and special events. And I climbed the uh, Trilon while it was being built with a pack transmitter on my back not wearing a hard hat and trying to duck these red-hot rivets that were flying from one end of the tower to the other. But uh, I really covered the construction of the World's Fair and the uh, city buildings and all the uh, magnificent edifices that were put up by the different countries. And, of course, then after the fair opened, we covered every one of the opening ceremonies at the foreign pavilions and then, of course, all the activities that were done at the uh, Court of Nations, as they called it, and then I emceed, or in those days you didn't call it emceeing. You were the announcer on a pop band show, the big dance bands, uh, Louis Prima and uh, Bunny Berrigan. I think you brought yeah, up Ben. Bernie was there. Glenn Gray, Gray. Ben Bernie. And there mm -hmm. are a couple of uh, amusing stories. I took Louis Prima for a uh, few moments respite during the afternoon performance and the evening performance. Took him up on the parachute tower. And Louis's shoes fell off when he hit the thing hit the top. And uh, he changed color slightly. And he vowed he would never go up on a parachute tower again. You know, from your collection of uh, band remotes, I think we could go back to the World's Fair, Ed. Yes, Dick, uh, these were kind of rare recordings. I do have uh, some broadcasts that were done uh, at the World's Fair itself. And uh, well, you ought to hear one just to, uh, just to put us in the mood for that particular period. Special features division of WOR brings you at this time the official closing ceremonies at the New York World's Fair 1939. During this broadcast, we can take you to several vantage points on the fairground for word pictures of the first act curtain in this spectacle of the world of tomorrow. But here, in the Mardi Gras Casino, is WOR's World's Fair reporter, that old smoothie, Ed Fitzgerald. Take it, Ed. Good morning, neighbors. Good morning. This is it. This is the deadline. The witching hour of the great international exhibit known as the New York World's Fair. Gray, weeping skies greeted this day and brought probably one of the smallest crowds of the entire year. It rained and the wind blew, but they came and they came to have fun. However, many of the exhibits closed down to avoid what they thought might be unruly crowd. However, here, in this far de Gras casino, some 3,500 enthusiastic young Americans are jitterbugging like mad to the splendid music of Jack Teagarden and his boy. I think it would be futile and a waste of time for me to discuss anything beyond this point, so I say to you, Mr. Teagarden, please play your thrill number, Man and His Dream.
practically for Jack Pierre Gordon and his boys. They're here to dance. They're here for music. Are you going to hear music? You're going to have a, hear a number written by Mr. Pierre Gordon called, oddly enough, Swinging on a Pierre Gordon Gate. Jill, my lad, Jill. <laughs> Taking us back to uh, 1939 with that sound from the World's Fair. Were you at CBS, with CBS at the time, uh, Tony, uh, when you were doing the coverage for the World? I Fair? was, uh, I was in between, uh, between WNYC and uh, CBS. I had uh, taken my audition at CBS, and I was scheduled to go with them, but uh, the World's Fair was in operation. Tony, you mentioned uh, the CBS audition. Oh, oh. Now, I want to hear about that CBS audition. What was it like? Well, it was murder. <laughs> it was absolute murder. After all, you know, in those days, I think even today, of course, why should it change when an announcer has an opportunity to uh, come down and audition for the big networks? Well, you know you were really in the big leagues, and they had a uh, an announcer's audition that uh, took at least... 45 minutes to an hour, and you had to have a minimum of three to five years' experience in the field prior to that. Uh, you had to have a working knowledge of two other languages, primarily French, German, because you did a lot of uh, symphonic work, and uh, you did operatic work, and you also had to be fast on your feet, and they'd lock you in a studio after you'd gone through a list of... Uh, Things from uh, Mussorgsky to uh, Beethoven and uh, all the rather esoteric types of uh, symphonic and operatic music, and you had to be conversant with that. And then they say, all right, now we, you have ten minutes. We want you to describe the studio and give a minute, uh, in minute detail just what it, uh, is in there and uh, just what you think. If you were locked in this room for ten minutes, how would you uh, occupy or tell someone about the cell you're incarcerated in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, of course, then they gave you news which you read cold. It was just handed to you, now go. And uh, you went. So that uh, when you got through, you knew that you had been put through a bit of a ringer. And uh, in my case, uh, I was called into the production office and uh, they said, well, you've been accepted and you will start on such and such a date. And I remember I almost fainted because I was going to become a member of the CBS staff. And I still love CBS. After all, it's my alma mater. But I remember dashing to the nearest phone booth and calling my wife and saying, Honey, guess what? I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful uh, thing. It really, yes, it was. It was marvelous. I'll never forget it. And, of course, the money was magnificent. That's right. They yeah, paid right. big money in those days for well, staff work. I want to tell you, when you were a staff announcer at CBS or NBC in those days, you were rolling in wealth. You started out at $50 <laughs> a week. <laughs> And if you were a good boy and did your job well at the end of five years, you now got $75 a week. Marvelous. <laughs> but, Tony, there were commercial opportunities for the announcer as well. Yes, there were. Uh, in those days, there were not too many freelance announcers. Uh, there were a few who did exceptionally well. But by and large, most of the radio commercial the sponsored shows were done by men on the staff. And the staff man uh, had to be capable of doing any kind of a commercial and had to be uh, capable of doing any kind of a show. How long might your average day run? Well, we ran an eight-hour day, eight-hour day. Uh, well, in the beginning, the junior boy came in. The first thing I did in the morning was the 6 o'clock news. So I had to get up at about 4 o'clock in the morning. And then you do a sustaining programs, if you remember what those were. You had uh, dramas and you had children's programs that were completely sustaining and put on as a public service by the networks. Uh, Nyla Max, Let's Pretend, uh, which was the great birthplace of so many, many performers. Uh, you had the School of the Air on CBS, which was a, a great standby for many years. Then, of course, you had your great house bands and orchestras. You had uh, the CBS symphonies. You had the little dance bands and... Uh, Every, and then you had a string ensemble in the mornings, you know. 
What about Major Bowes? This oh. was uh, a big event in your career. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. That was my first network commercial. And uh, I was scared silly, to tell you the truth, because I'd only been on the net for about three months. And Ralph Edwards had been the announcer for Major Bowes and the Chrysler Corporation. And uh, the word came through the production office that all of us were to get ourselves over to Playhouse 3. And uh, there was an audition to replace Ralph. Well, I turned around and I saw Andre Barouche and I saw Frank Gallup and I saw David Ross and I saw, well, you name them, they were there. And we got up there and... Uh, Old Major was seated out front, and of course, three or four of the people from the agency handling Chrysler. And uh, we read the commercials and did the intros. And my, by the time I got back across town from the production office, the chief called me and he said, Tony, you've just won the Chrysler audition. And I went to a, a swoon. <laughs> this was it. And it was just great when I saw some fantastic <laughs> acts on that yeah, thing. Yeah. We had spoon players, uh, automobile pump players, uh, musical saw players. We had one chap who came in and uh, played the xylophone on his head. By <laughs> changing the aperture of his mouth, he uh, emitted various and sundry <laughs> groans and whatnot. Of course, by that time, uh, the major had taken the hook out of the business. Yes, uh, that's yes. right. But uh, uh, we went to the gong then, and he did yeah. the gong. Say, all right, all right, you know, next. <laughs> and uh, They still would cart them off, though. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, he did manage to put a few in like that to make the show interesting, didn't oh, he? Oh, yes, I, I think so. We had a wonderful gal by the name of Bessie Mack who really uh, sat there and did all the pre-auditioning. And, of course, uh, of course, the producer and director did. But we'd sit around, and I, I could see this thing building. She'd always save one or two of these real yo-yos, you know, for the, for the big laugh, and it had to be. But uh, it was an astounding show. You're listening to The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertel and the recordings of Ed Corcoran. Brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Serving Central Connecticut since 1889 and by WTIC. Do you know how being a preferred borrower at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank can help you? The other day, a man who was waiting in the personal loan department was asked if this was the first time that he had applied for a loan at the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. No, he said. It was actually the fourth. Why had he come back to the Burrett? Burrett was his bank. The loan officers were friendly and sympathetic to his needs, and they were willing to take the time to discuss his financial problems and help him. The rates are lower, he said. Monthly payments are convenient. And once he had established credit at the Burrett, he had become a preferred borrower, and his loans got top priority. Sounds like a position you'd like to be in? If so, drop in at any one of the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank's five convenient offices in New Britain, West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury. You too may become a preferred Burrett borrower. The long-term benefits are tremendous. What was it That's like great. to do the Columbia Symphony? It was marvelous. It was marvelous. Uh, matter of fact, uh, there's another story out of school prior to the Columbia Symphony. Well, I had been doing the Columbia Symphony with Howard Barlow, who was then the uh, conductor, brilliant man, fine conductor. But uh, Frank Gallup had been doing the New York Philharmonic broadcasts. And for some reason, Frank uh, was away. Or he couldn't make that particular Sunday. And they said, all right, uh, Tony, you get over there and do the uh, Philharmonic. And I did. And Jim Fassett was the producer. Jim later became president of the Columbia Records and whatnot. And Jim was my producer sitting next to me. And uh, we ran through the program. And on the air we go. And everything went beautifully. It came to the end of the program. Uh, I was going to sign off. And I said, well, this is such a distinguished program. And I said, your commentator for the this afternoon's Philharmonic concert has been Anthony Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I said, oh, you know, this is... You know. <laughs> so I got back to the production office, Jerry Malsby. I think Jerry just retired recently. I said, hey, Tony, he says, who's this guy, Anthony Marvin? <laughs> I said, why? I said, you know, that's my name. He says, I know. He says, but around here, you're Tony, and I don't ever want to hear you called Anthony by yourself or anybody else. <laughs> well, that took care of Anthony Marvin. <laughs> Good story. We have an excerpt from a show that uh, Tony was associated with, and uh, before we hear it, I think we should talk about it. One which we have never discussed before, to my knowledge, Hobby Lobby. 
Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I did that with Bob Dixon, uh, Dave Ellman, who was the original uh, MC and creator of Hobby Lobby, had decided that he didn't uh, want to do any more air work. And they came up with the concept that they'd have a, uh, a co-host uh, operation. Well, Bob Dixon is a very talented guy. He uh, is still around doing uh, things in our business. And we had these uh, rather strange hobbyists, uh, coin collectors, that they're not strange. They're very well to do. With them, right? But there were some uh, odd ones. I think that were escapees from the old Major Bo show. They finally got uh, the Hobby Lobby. You, know? you on the show when the lady had the singing dog. I remember that yes, very well. Were yes, you really? indeed. Sure, sure. And uh, again, we had uh, people who raised uh, flowers, and they talked to them, you know, and the flowers would squeak. We had a squeaking flower <laughs> oh, person. Boy. All sorts of uh, weird things. <laughs> but then again, we had some very unusual guests. Uh, some of the Hollywood uh, stars would come in, and uh, they had hobbies, and they'd talk about it. It was a good show. Well, let's listen to Hobby Lobby. Well, I thought maybe you, you might remember this. Uh, a man interested in graveyards. you recall anybody with a hobby like that? No, there were so many, but... Uh... Well, this one, the voice we might be familiar to you when you hear it, so why don't we play it, Dick? <laughs> Gentlemen, it's for you. And now, on with the tour. Hey, Dave, you're walking too fast. I know, Tony, but we've got to catch him. Well, who is he? Well, don't you recognize him? He's the man whose wit is enjoyed by millions of listeners when he assumes the role of Titus Moody on the Fred Allen Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Parker Finley. Well, Parker, you look very happy this evening. Yeah, I just got back from the graveyard. <laughs> the graveyard? What were you doing there? Catching up with my reading. Well, doesn't your wife let you read in the house? Oh, shucks, that ain't it. No, I walk around the graveyard reading the tombstones, collecting epitaphs. That's my hobby. You ought to read some of them. <laughs> Bet on the funny. <laughs> Well, I haven't time to go out there now. Do you remember any of those tombstone inscriptions? Dave, I remember them all. All right, Parker, let's hear a few. Well, sir. <clears throat> Beneath this stone lies Reginald Chuck. He called his mother-in-law a ten-ton truck. <laughs> Snappy stuff, eh, Dave? <laughs> now, here's another one. Dead at the age of 30 lies our friend William Mundry. He's the author of that famous book, How to Live to Be a Hundred. <laughs> well, I'm beginning to see your point. Here's a pipero. Three times she had her face lifted. Our dear beloved Miss Eliza. And so we pray and hope the good Lord will recognize her. <laughs> and not, uh, not far away from Eliza, I found this one. Here lies Joe, the waiter. God finally got his eye. <laughs> well, uh, Parker, Justin, aren't there any serious tombstones in that graveyard? Yeah, yeah, here's the best one. Always crawling out from under was Councilman Jonathan Bliss. And now the voters would like to see the Councilman crawl out of this. <laughs> so here. Here's something you don't know. There's a tombstone out there with an advertisement on it. An advertisement on a tombstone? Yeah. It's the oldest tombstone in the graveyard. And this is what it says. Sacred to the memory of Elma Klinger, who died April 12, 1801, leaving a 60-acre farm to his widow, who is young, intelligent, affectionate, and easy to please. That's all. Thank you, Parker Bentley.
You know, just, just hearing you talk, Tony, uh, makes me realize how flexible the announcer had to be. You were a, a newscaster. You, you had to cover special events. You were sent down the hall to do the Columbia <laughs> Symphony. You, you had to uh, introduce a, a soap opera. You had to be able to sell. Mm -hmm. We don't have that flexibility in the business today. We don't, re we don't require it. No, we've, we've become so specialized now, Dick, that uh, I, for one, uh, feel very, very unhappy about that because uh, there's very little uh, area for the young, aspiring announcer or uh, radio personality, let us put, put it that way, to uh, find all of his facets, to find his, uh, his abilities in all these fields. He does get locked into a very narrow corridor, and that, that is unfortunate. Uh, no, in those days, you had to be a one-man gang, and a good one-man gang, or else you weren't around very long. They didn't uh, stand for anything at all. That's one of the reasons I feel so much at home here at WTIC, because it has the same aura, the same feeling, the same demand for excellence that CBS had all the way through. Oh, you're very kind to say that. I mean that. <laughs> I mean that most sincerely. Let's talk about uh, another show that our audience is going to recognize. This one, uh, an adventure story. Casey, crime photographer. Yes, and uh, he says photographer like no one else can, uh, <laughs> as you'll hear in the introduction. You know, I think he changed the uh, everybody's Did pronunciation of the word. <laughs> <laughs> the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you crime photographer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, King of the Apes. <laughs> Good afternoon, the Blue Note Cafe. Leaning comfortably on the bar are Casey and Ann Williams. And behind the bar, it's Chief Custodian Ethelbert. You and Miss Williams are going to the circus tonight, huh, Casey? Yeah, we gotta go, pal. It's an assignment. <laughs> Every year, Ethelbert, he's found an excuse to go to the circus. You, you think I'd like to go to the circus, honey? Well, if you don't, you'd better reserve yourself a chair in the old men's home. <laughs> She's right, Casey. Any guy who can't enjoy the circus is slipping and fast. Mm, I love the clowns and the elephants. I still like the brass bands and the peanuts and popcorn. Well, I go for the lady bareback riders and the lady acrobats and the lady... That's uh, enough. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to establish that I'm not slipping, Annie. I'm simply matured, that's all. Hmm. What kind of assignment you two got at the big show? Principally, we're covering the feature act, King of the Eight. They say that's swell. According to pictures on the billboards, that fella, the king, keeps 20 or 30 giant gorillas under his complete control. Now, circus posters sometimes exaggerate a little bit, Ethelbert. The 20 or 30 giant gorillas are really six orangutans. And their trainer isn't the king. His name is King, Charles King. Oh, but an orangutan is a pretty big monkey, isn't it? Big enough. A full-grown male can break a couple of Joe Lewis's in two. Then I guess six orangutans are plenty for a guy to go into a cage alone with. I'd say so. Well, we better get over to the circus, Annie. It's nearly time for our date. Oh, uh yeah. -huh. I thought you said you were going to the circus tonight. We're interviewing Mr. King after the matinee performance. We're seeing the show tonight. Oh. Well, so long, pal. So long, Ethelbert. Have a good time, and uh, don't let him lock you up in the monkey cage. <laughs> Nuts to you, pal, and so long. <laughs> so long, Casey. And nuts to you. King's dressing room is this way, Annie. Good 
the afternoon show is still going on. Casey, let's peek through those back curtains. Oh, no, no, no. Look, we'll see the whole thing from out front tonight, Annie. Besides, that's the wind-up you hear now, the grand finale. Oh, yeah, I guess it is. The clowns are coming from the ring. Oh, let's walk. Oh, I've seen clowns before. We've got a date, Oh, Annie. just We're... a minute, Casey. Oh, okay. Some nice-looking uh, uh, performers coming through the curtains now. That, that one in the black spangled tights has got beautiful eyes. <laughs> we'll find Mr. King. Oh, I'm in no hurry, We've Annie. We've got a date. Huh? Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right, there, there, there's... That's the star dressing room there. Well, give a knock. Oh, wait a minute. There's several star dressing rooms. Well, here's the one with the king's name Don't on it. Don't you dare call me that. I'll call you worse if I catch you with that fun of Vanilla again. You oh. better knock your big pelota. A little argument inside this that room, Casey. Oh, king. I'm fed up with your jealousy. If I feel like talking to a man, any man, I'm going to... Well, I'm not going to sneak up in corners with Vanilla again, I Try and you. stop me. I'll stop you. Don't words. you put your hands on Don't me. Don't Time to break me. this up, Annie. Come mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. That knock should do it. Uh, who, who's there? Uh, Miss Williams and Casey in the Morning Express. If you're Mr. King, your press agent made a date for us to see you. Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Uh, just a moment. Mm-hmm. That right. ended the battle, Casey. Sure did. <laughs> The most daring, colossal, engrossing, educational exhibition of man's mastery over the savage beast that has ever been witnessed in the history of the universe. Sit, Annie, this is King's the Annie. Strongest, They're throwing up the most cage, King's yeah. Most dangerously intelligent animals known to me. Just outside over on the left there, Annie. Oh, let's see. Look, Casey. They're letting the apes into the ring cage now from those wagons. Dillinger's coming into the cage now. Ooh, he's a mean-looking animal. Mm. I'm sorry we're not going to see Nimbu do his stuff. He's the real star of this action. Yeah, and King depends on him. He told me he doesn't have to carry that big whip in the ring with him when Nimbo's there. Yeah, he's look, the boss. Look, Annie, look. The big monks are going to ride this tricycle. Look at that, Annie. Look at that. I uh, thought you didn't care for circuses. Uh, oh, well, it's part of my job to come here and take pictures, that's all. What was that? Funny cry, wasn't it? Animal or something, I guess. Casey, those big apes stopped riding in that cry. Yeah. King can't get them to start again. Seem to be listening. There it goes again. Hey, look at Dillinger. He's grabbed Mr. King. He's killing him. He's got him by the throat, Annie. Annie, I'm going to shoot some pictures of this. That cry we heard, Annie. I've got a hunch this wasn't any accident. Be a payday saver at the Big B, Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Come into any office of Burrett on the first day, last day, 15th day, or any day of the month, and you will meet a select group of savers, the payday savers, businessmen, tradesmen, professional people, career girls, and even mothers who save from the grocery money. Why do these people all stop in at the Big B? To save on a regular and very profitable basis. A payday saver is a regular saver. A saver who knows that only through a systematic plan of savings will he be able to pay for that college education, new home, or retirement trip around the world. At the Burrett, the payday saver receives 5% on a regular account with interest from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, 6% on two-year certificates of deposit, 5 and 3 quarters percent on one-year certificates, and five and a quarter percent on 90-day notice accounts. Join your friends at the sign of the Big B, the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, with offices in New Britain, West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury.
become a payday saver. Deposits insured by FDIC. Tony, I know our, our listeners have been uh, wondering when we would get to the Godfrey Show. And <laughs> I mean, holding up as long as we could. Huh? That's the part of the program. <laughs> yes, <we're> right Dick. <laughs> <laughs> so it is Arthur Godfrey time. 1946 is the year. Mm -hmm, that's right. Uh, well, it was a strange thing. Uh, Arthur asked me to join him on that show. Uh, actually, Arthur uh, had been given uh, an opportunity to go network. Up to that time, he had been uh, the local morning man. He'd come up from Washington to take over the 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. slot. And was doing both shows, as yes, I Yes, for a couple for a of years. Yes, he was. But uh, they had great uh, belief in Arthur, and he certainly proved that belief because he be is, without a doubt, one of the great salesmen of all time. I learned an awful lot while I was with him, 14 years about uh, Arthur had come to me one afternoon and asked me if I could um, work the show. And I said, well, gee, Arthur, I, I really can't. I'm, uh, you know, involved in the soap operas, and I have this to do and that to do. And I said, besides, Arthur, you're a sustaining program. You know, there's no, no loot involved. Let's face it, you know, you're, when you're concerned about making enough to keep body and soul together, although by then we have been doing quite well. But I really was very busy. And, uh... I said, well, I'll try to work out something on the schedule. And uh, I said, I I'll take the assignment Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because I know Tuesdays and Thursdays were dead for me then. In any event, uh, did that with Arthur for about four or five weeks. And he came to me again after the show. He said, my goodness, Tony, what do you do to that audience? He says, I've never had such a response. I said, well, I said, I don't know. I, I said, I like people. I enjoy talking with them. I uh, am a little garrulous at times, albeit a little uh, ponderous, I suppose. But I said, that's a, an attitude that you develop if you want to do a particular kind of warm-up. But I said, uh, the, he said, no, he said, I'm talking about how do you bring them to that point where I get this warmth from them? I said, well, I said, I find it very, very important that in doing a warm-up, you don't overdo it. You can do a warm-up that is so great and so fine and so humorous that when the star comes on, he's absolutely nothing. He falls flat on his face. So I said, I managed, I think, to get to that point where when I bring you on, why, now they're ready for the, for the big yaks. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I might as well get lost. Mm -hmm. So it worked out that way. And uh, finally, we worked out the schedule, and uh, we shifted the time, I think, and we went to the 10 a.m. slot. And we were on there for another month or so, and then Arthur came to me and said, Tony, there's an outfit by the name of Liggett and Myers, and they make a cigarette called Chesterfield. And he said, they're interested in buying the show, and he said, you and I both smoke camels. <laughs> <laughs> what shall we do? I said, Arthur, we are now smoking <laughs> Chesterfield. And, of course, it didn't take long. But, uh, <laughs> we agreed. <laughs> and they were off for a sponsor. Well, we went from a half... They bought us a half hour across the board, Monday through Friday. And, of course, Arthur and I just went at it hammer and tongs, and um, anything could happen. We never knew. What, we never had a script. Uh, we just got a rundown on the commercials. Of course, all the dialogue was absolutely uh, ad-lib. And then we had some very, very amusing and <laughs> amazing incidents on the air. <laughs> you know, this is perhaps one of the rarest shows to find because it was so plentiful when it was on the air. On the air five days a week, it was always there. Nobody bothered to, to uh, make a record of it and uh, put it aside. However, in 1947, with my disc recorder, <laughs> oh. I was preparing for this business. I decided one day I would record Tony Marvin on the air. And I let the disc go for an hour and a half, and we're going to hear an excerpt from the old Arthur Godfrey show right now. You are tuned to CBS. Glass wax cleans 30 kinds of dirt in 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, you wipe it on and then you wipe it off. Yeah, yeah. The Goldfield Company, maker of that sensational chemical cleaning discovery, Glass Wax, presents Arthur Godfrey Time. Godfrey and all the little Godfrey's, Jeanette Davis, the Mariners, and Archie Blyer and his orchestra. And now, here's that man himself, Arthur, you'll be tickled pink, Godfrey! Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tony Marvin. 
I'm going to start out with a telegram I received last night from Hartford, Connecticut. Arthur Godfrey, Columbia Broadcasting System. You think Thursday's program was terrible. You should hear today's. <laughs> Signed, Harriet Kellish. We take a wire to Miss Kellish. The dear Miss Kellish, if you think yesterday's program was terrible, wait until you hear today. <laughs> Actually, I didn't think yesterday's show was so lousy, did you? Huh? I thought it was a pretty good show. Right after the broadcast, I got a telegram from the company saying if we ever lost a sponsor, they'd like to buy our show because it would do a great job for their product. Where's that one? Uh, oh, here it is. Here, yes. Signed by the president of the White Striped Fur Company. <laughs> You know, in judging a show like this one, to be fair, you have to take into consideration the fact that we do an hour show every day of the week. You can't expect them all to be great. In fact, I was talking to the, just the other day to a CBS vice president. We have one that can talk. And I... <laughs> I explained to him uh, very logically, too that you have to judge this show over a period of time. See, you know, you have a good one, a bad one, a good one, a bad one. It's just like a basket of apples. And he said, yeah, it's just like a basket of apples, all right. You get a couple more bad ones, we'll throw out the whole bunch. <laughs> well, I always tell my sponsors not to worry too much about my jokes. This whole program is deductible anyway. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Look. We've been working on a thing here, Archie and the Mariners and I, all morning. Archie tells me that this is quite a tune, that you folks are nuts about it. All right. Okay, so you're nuts about it. Let me see what happens when I get through with it. <laughs> I've faced a barren waste without the taste of water. Cool water. Old Dan and I, the throats burnt dry and so something to do with one guy wants some water. <laughs> Ladies, do you have trouble deciding whether or not you are overdressed? 
Well, if you do, then you will be interested in this new system that Eleanor King has worked out. She calls it the rule of 14. And she says if you follow this formula, dressing to go out at night will be as simple as adding up a column of figures. <laughs> I saw a gal last night who must have been dressed that way. The column of figures looked okay, but I think she had a decimal point in the wrong place. <laughs> But anyway, here's the way Miss King's rule of 14 works. You allow so many points for each article of dress, and then you keep score, see? For instance, one crepe afternoon dress, allow one point. With peplum, one more point. Suede sandals, that's two points. Because there's one on each foot, see? <laughs> a brown felt sailor hat, four points. Five if your head has a point. <laughs> a pouch purse, one point. Two gold trinkets, one point. Two gold bracelets on one hand, one point. Two gold earrings, one point. A short fur jacket, one point. One gold necklace, two points. Now, you've allowed yourself the points, Miss King says. You quickly add them up. The total is 18. That's too much. You're overdressed. You've got to eliminate four points quickly. <laughs> what can you do, says Miss King? It's too late now to change your fundamentals. And besides, maybe your only other pair is still in the laundry, so what are you going to do? So here's where Miss King's formula comes to your rescue. A count of 18 points, she says, indicates you have too much on from the neckline up. So she says, begin there and take things off until you're down to 14. <laughs> I'm adding you up, Jeanette. <laughs> you come to about seven. <laughs> so, you see, uh, now that... Uh, yeah, you can't hide anywhere, <laughs> can you? <laughs> come back to haunt you. <laughs> because I decided to... Uh, Listen to you and to study your style. We we have that. Uh, you don't show. sound like him, though, Dick. Uh, I don't know what what the. No, I've noticed is. that, Ed. I uh, I I. <laughs> no, I just a just a quirk. Of I don't nature, dare. You know you know the stories, of course, Tony, and I'm sure you were involved in the elevator stories at uh, NBC and CBS, oh, yeah. where the voices would get deeper and deeper. And I decided a long time ago I would never compete <laughs> with that. <laughs> they, were, they were really something. What happened when you parted? Did you part, friends? Oh, Arthur and I. Yes, yes. Very much so. Well, of course, he had been ill, you know, and uh, Arthur had this uh, lung removed. He had uh, developed carcinoma of the lung, and uh, it was pretty much touch and go. They, at least the doctors thought it was very bad, but uh, he decided he'd better cut down on his operations, uh, radio and TV-wise. And so uh, by that time, we had run the string out just about, I guess, and uh, Arthur and I parted company. Uh, he made it very, very... Plain. He said, Tony, there's no more budget for a guy of your price right now and under our contract. And our, that was the end of the second seven-year contract. He says, I'm going to do just do the commercials myself. There'll be no one to act as a buffer for me, and we'll just go. And uh, we parted as good friends. I see him every so often uh, in New York. And I saw him about four months ago, and he looks fine. He, uh, Red-headed as ever, you know, and uh, just as uh, sprightly and uh, brilliant. Well, how about uh, some of the people who are on the show? Uh, could you tell us where they are today, like Marion Marlowe or uh, the um, some of the singers and so forth? Yeah, I, I think I can. Well, Marion Marlowe was still in the business. The uh, last I saw Marion, she was uh, in The Follies, a uh, show in New York. Frank Parker, the chap we talked about magnificent tenor. Uh, Frank is retired. Frank is honestly retired. He's enjoying himself, uh, having a lot of fun. He still lives in New York and looks great. What about the Mariners? The this? Mariners are out of the business, Mariners? completely. The uh, Cordettes are all out of the business, all retired. Archie Blyer, who was our orchestra leader at one point there for the longest time, Married one of the Cordettes, and uh, he's retired, but uh, I ran into him about a year ago. He looks marvelously well, and he's uh, still taking lessons. He's taking lessons in conducting now. He, he loves music that much. 
Uh, who else? Holly Loki. Holly Loki is retired. Ask about yeah. Holly Loki. <laughs> Holly is uh, fine and well, and uh, she uh, spends a great deal of time down in Miami, in Florida. I think it's Miami or somewhere in the environs there. Maybe. Jeanette Davis. Yeah, right. Jeanette is retired completely and uh, raising a family, and they live out on Long Island. She married one of our producers, a chap by the name of Frank Musiello. And uh, I understand I hadn't seen Jeanette in uh, about two years. Jeanette uh, doesn't come into New York too much. She comes in maybe once or twice a year. She says, that's enough. I don't, I don't care for the big town anymore. You know? It's so amazing how people's lives really change. They're, they're all around the business of you, Tony. Huh? I guess so. Uh, yeah, well, I'm much too young. <laughs> much too young. You know? But, Tony, uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're on a freelance basis now, and you've, you've yes. worked your, your work week down to about three days a week. Now, let, let me ask you, aside sure. from the fact that you're able to play golf mm -hmm. and enjoy life, yeah. do you miss the uh, the pace of of the business that uh, that you knew in the in the thirties in the, the, in the early days in the early days yeah. <laughs> in, in the olden days the golden as we kids days, days. Uh, no not really <laughs> no, <don't>. not really <laughs> uh, I miss some of the uh, the weird and wild moments we had both on and off the air. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I don't really miss that uh, terrible pace because uh, there, there were times that you just didn't know whether you could survive it. You know, there were mm. so many things that you had to do. You were forced into this pace. You weren't, you weren't driven within yourself, but the very business itself made you rush. But I don't miss it too much. I do miss the camaraderie. I do miss the, the fun and the laughs and the... Uh, off-stage things that went on sometimes because uh, radio was uh, sort of a, a movie script idea of what radio was in the early days, you know. Marvelous memories. And, Tony, I want to thank you very much for sharing them with us tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio. Well, I thank you very much, Dick, and you, Ed, too, for having me here. And until next time, this is Dick Bertel. Ed Corcoran. Good night. The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertel and the recordings of Ed Corcoran has been brought to you by WTIC and by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889. Be sure to hear the next Golden Age of Radio broadcast Thursday, August 23rd, when our guests will be actresses Gail Storm and Barbara Britton. With the engineering and technical assistance of Bob Shurego, the Golden Age of Radio is produced and edited by Brian Hartnett. This is Norm Peters. ...program from the Paradise Restaurant in the Great White Way of Manhattan, New York City. Played by Glenn Miller and his orchestra. They all... Are you still there? A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty... Are you still there?